Malachi chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 to 5. Everyone should know where it is, end of the Old Testament, page 849. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountains into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. The Edom says, we've been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says this, they may build, but I will demolish. They'll be called a wicked country and the people the Lord has cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I never thought, like a number of times recently, that I'd begin a sermon this way, uh, but I want to begin in 2003 with a song by the Black Eyed Peas called Where Is The Love? Now, let me admit, I actually really like this song. Uh, I really like it. Uh, It's probably the only song I like from them. Uh, But it really is, I think, a really terrific observation that there is a distinct lack of love in the world. And uh, I I admit it, I'm a softie. Every time I watch the video clip or see it, there is at least one moment where I get tears in my eyes. Uh, It's a world full of racism. It's a world full of misinformation, violence and pain. And in that kind of world, the Black Eyed Peas ask, where is the love? And they actually say there needs to be more love. Uh, The world needs to be a better place where love is more evident, obvious and practical. Uh, The chorus in particular expresses that. Now, if I was Mr Bailey, I could rap this, but I can't, so I won't. Uh, Father, 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 help us. Send some guidance from above because people got me, got me questioning, where is the love? Now, I don't know about you, but I suspect as one of God's mob, you might have sung that kind of line at some point in your life. As one of God's mob, have you ever looked around at your world and wondered, where is the love of God for his people? As one of God's mob, do you ever doubt that God actually loves you, one of his people? And as you think about that, have you ever thought, well, if God doesn't really love me, If it's all just lip service, perhaps I don't need to give him the devotion he deserves. I mean, if he's not going to love me, why should I love him? Well, let me reassure you, uh, God's mob have been here before, many a time, and Malachi speaks to a time like this. Let me pray, and we're going to look at it together. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for people we know nothing about, like Malachi, except that they spoke your word to a people who are asking, where's the love? And you spoke through them in reassurance, in confrontation, in deep, committed, relentless love. Father, help us to hear those words today as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline, an oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. We have an oracle. Literally, it's a burden. Uh, It's from the Lord. It's to Israel, spoken through Malachi. Well done, Bernard. You've just said the same thing twice. Uh, It sounds repetitious, but we need to say it twice because we need to actually pause and slow down and see that there is a huge amount just in this verse. This is a prophecy. God's word delivered to God's people by a human being. It's against the backdrop of covenant. If you've got a pen, write that word down, covenant. Did you see the name used for God there in the first verse? Did you see how it's in capitals, Lord? It's his covenant name, the name that he has for his mob and that his mob have for him. Uh, Covenant is a very simple thing. It's a binding agreement between two or more people and there are obligations on both sides. 
And God has made a covenant with a man called Abraham and his family. Remember them? We're looking at them as we work our way through the book of Genesis. We just heard a reading about the descendants of Abraham's boy Isaac. God makes a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 and 17. God says, Abraham, you're mine. I am relentlessly committed to you. And Abraham responds by saying, you're mine, God. I am relentlessly committed to you. And the reason God does this is because he's committed to his broken world. Because through Abraham and through Abraham's mob, God's going to reverse the curse and bring his blessing back to a broken world. That covenant passes to Abraham's son Isaac, and we heard about that as Haley read from Genesis 25, from Isaac's son, uh, from Isaac to his son Jacob, onto their descendants Israel. They meet God as a huge mob, over a million, at Mount Sinai. God's just saved his people from slavery in Egypt. Remember we gather on the front lawn each year to remember that moment? And as he saved them from slavery, he brings them to himself. And at Mount Sinai, Genesis 15 and 17 are replayed, but not just with Abraham, but with over a million people. I'm committed to you. You're my mob. I am relentless in this commitment. And they say very clearly, we're committed to you, God. We will be just as relentless. In fact, we're going to do the job you've given us. Exodus 19, 1 to 8. We're going to show you to the world by obeying you. Because as we obey you, people will see your nature, see your character. We've got to get this straight. God saved them. God commits to them. They commit to showing God to the world in obedience. It's an exclusive relationship. God to them, them to God. And in that exclusive relationship, there are consequences for either party if they break their commitment. You can read about them in Deuteronomy 28 through to 30. And you can see what those consequences are for both sides. And the whole purpose of this, so that God will deal with the brokenness of the world. The whole purpose of this single-minded, relentless commitment of God to that mob so that the whole world can be restored. So now we know where we are in the Bible, don't we? It's got to be after Exodus. (laughs) It's got to be after Mount Sinai. It's got to be after the period where God spoke to Abraham. It's got to be after the period where God's people were in a land that God had promised them. So we know where we are in the timeline, not just where we are in the books, last book of the Old Testament. We know where we are in the timeline, but it's really interesting that in Malachi there are very few time markers given. I look at the other prophets you'll often get in the reign of this king or at this time or when this earthquake happened. Uh, We're not given any of that here. We're just given little hints. So if you've got your Bibles open there, look down at Malachi chapter 1, verse 8. There's a word for governor there. Really strange when you're writing in Hebrew, you suddenly use a word from Persia. That tells you that maybe the governor comes from Persia, which tells you that probably Persia's the king pin in the district. And that gives us a definite time frame. As you read through the book, and Mr. Bailey's going to look at this next week with the temple, uh, they've rebuilt God's temple. Remember Haggai? We looked at Haggai last year. They've rebuilt the temple, and the temple's been rebuilt And it's been around long enough for them to get really lazy, really half-hearted. So now we know we're at least after Exodus at a time when Persia is ruling the world and the temple's been built, that's 516 BC, and we know that God's people have been back in the land long enough to get lazy. And as we'll see today, to start doubting God's love. I think I've got a marker here. Yeah, You can't really see it really well there, but the last bloke standing there, right there at the end between 500 and 400 BC, that's Malachi. That is from your Bible study booklets where you can see it in much better font and much clearer. And you can see where Malachi relates to all the other prophets. He's the last one. And you'll see above, he's around about the same time as Haggai, Zechariah, when God's people are back in the land and they're starting to get lazy again. They're back in the land because they'd left the land. 
God had kicked them out because they actually hadn't been committed to him. Remember that covenant? We're going to be wholehearted for you, God. And they weren't. God was wholehearted to them, but the consequences came and they were removed from the land. They were removed by a nation called Babylon and then Babylon was taken over by Persia and now they've been sent back and they've rebuilt their capital, they've rebuilt the temple, remember Haggai? But as they look around, gee, it's so disappointing. It's like someone has shrunk the temple because someone certainly shrunk their borders and their agriculture has been through drought after drought and they've been through famine after famine. Their economy is tanking and living costs are rising. Their farming is failing and everywhere they look, life is tough. It is, well, let me be blunt, it's just grey all the time. And at that time, a man called Malachi spoke. And he spoke the word of the Lord to his people. And that's all we know about Malachi. When he spoke, he followed a pattern. And we're going to follow this pattern each week. And it roughly goes like this. The Lord brings an accusation to his mob. The mob he's committed to. They respond. And then the Lord brings an assertion or application. At each time... The Lord is saying to his mob, I'm committed to you. We have a covenant. Are you committed to me? Are you committed to me? And the accusation that kicks off the start of the book is there in verse 2. I'm at point 3 on the outline. Look at verse 2. I've loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? The Lord has loved The Lord does love. The Lord will always love his mob. As his people hear this, they look around their landscape and they see that the dominant colour is grey. They think about how the morning has gone and how it's been a struggle. They think about how their bones ache, how their bank account is rapidly being depleted. They think about the crops that have been decimated. They think about how it's been like that for weeks and months and years. And they look around at their world and they listen to God saying, I've loved you, and do you notice what they say? But you ask, how? Where's the love? I think we can appreciate that, can't we? I think as God's mob, we've even echoed that question or spoke it out aloud. Everything is shriveled and contracted. Even their enemies, like their close cousins Edom, seem to have a really big national revival on the books. And God's mob, well, they're on the brink of oblivion. There just seems to be very little evidence that God actually loves them. Very little emotional or tangible evidence that God actually does love his people. And that's the foundational point of the whole prophecy. It lies at the heart of the Lord's call of his people back to him because God just reiterates this time and time again, if not explicitly, at least as an undercurrent, I love you, I love you, I love you. And that question lies at the half-hearted and grudging commitment they show to him. I mean, where is the love? We've cried out, Lord, for an intervention. We've cried out for an assurance. Just a little shore up today so I can get through to lunchtime. Just a little bit of evidence that you're committed to me, so I'll be committed to you. Where is the love? Does that sound a little bit familiar? A little bit like maybe what we talked about last week in our hearts or last month or maybe next week? And the Lord responds with an assertion. I'm at point four on the outline. And he takes them on a trip back through their history. Look there in verse 2. Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountains into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. Let's go back to your family tree. Now, our family trees are fairly dry events, aren't they, most of the time? This one's not. Uh, Let me go back to Genesis chapter 25. In fact, let me use that to remind you 
of my history with you. Remember Abraham? Remember what he was doing when I spoke to him in Babylon? Joshua 24 verse 2 tells us he was bowing down to idols. And God chose Abraham, not because there was anything to recommend Abraham, but purely because God was lovingly committed to a rebellious world. God provided Abraham with a son, Isaac. Abraham was as good as a shriveled prune. And yet God gave him a son. God chose to provide this man and his wife with a son, even as they laughed at the promises of God. God chose to pass this commitment to that boy, Isaac, not because of anything that recommended Isaac, but because God is loving and relentless in his love to his broken world. Uh, Isaac has a wife called Rebecca. Isaac has prayed for his wife, Rebecca, for 20 years since their marriage that Rebecca have children. And suddenly she's got two boys in a womb and they're at Twin War. Remember that? Rebecca turns to the Lord and asks the Lord what is going on. And the Lord says that the covenant, the agreement, the binding commitment that was made with Abraham and then passed to Isaac would pass to the younger of the boys. The older will serve the younger. The boys are born and Esau is like a fur rug, hairy and wild and red. Jacob, well, he's smooth and cunning. And God's commitment... That's to the second, and the first will serve the second. The Lord chooses to commit to his world through Jacob. Now, uh, let me tell you, there is nothing to recommend Jacob. When did the Lord commit to him? When he was in the womb, and we learnt when we looked at Psalm 51 and children that from conception I am sinful. Uh, So there's nothing about Jacob in the womb to recommend him. Even there, he's a sinner. It's not even as if the Lord goes, actually, I know he's going to turn out all right. He's a bit of a bad bunch at the moment, but he's going to get there, so I'll commit. No, it's not even that, because Jacob remains a conniving grub the rest of his life. There's nothing about Jacob to recommend him to the Lord. Why does the Lord commit to him? Because the Lord commits out of loving grace giving to a broken world the blessing it doesn't deserve, giving to the undeserving what they can never earn, achieve, warrant or buy or inherit. The Lord's commitment is established not because of Jacob's merit but because of the Lord's nature. His gracious, relentless, generous, persistent love for a world that consistently rejects him. And it confounds our logic, doesn't it? but it displays his nature. And that's the environment to grasp those hard words. Did you see them there? Those hard words in verses 2 and 3, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Uh, we, We mustn't understand these words through our emotions, through how we use words like this, through our psychology. Now, there is emotion here, but it's not emotional language. And we mustn't understand them either as dogmatic, Uh, There's no turning back from these words uh, because we know that someone from every tribe, language and tongue will be in heaven, even people from Edom and Esau. Now, these words are covenant words. I've committed to Jacob and I've not committed to Esau. I've covenanted with Jacob and I've not covenanted with Esau. Now, uh, to grasp a little bit of that, think about the imagery of marriage. That's the image actually God uses for the rest of the Bible to describe this, isn't it? This covenant. Uh, When a man and a woman covenant in marriage, they do so to each other exclusively, to the exclusion of everyone else. And the marriage service makes that clear. Does that mean they hate everyone else? No, but everyone else is excluded because they are committed to each other, to the exclusion of all. The Lord loves his mob. Just look at his commitment to Jacob. The Lord loves his people, not because they're more worthy, more lovely, more deserving, but because he chose to, in his nature, to be gracious and loving to a world that has rejected him. And the Lord does this for the benefit of the world. 
In fact, the mere fact that Jacob can stand there and question God is proof, isn't it? Because they're still there and where's Esau and his descendants called Edom? Well, look at what the Lord has done to them. I turned his mountains into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. When God's people were taken away by Babylon, who was there standing at the city gates cheering? It was Esau and Edom. Who was there along the road who cut down anyone who was slow or picked them up and handed them over to the Babylonians? Oh, there was Esau and Edom. Who was there saying, you little ripper, our brother is taken away, now we can take the land? Well, that was Esau and Edom. Just read Psalm 137 verse 7, read all of Obadiah. And so the Lord judged Esau and Edom. The Lord is for his people and against their enemies. The Lord's love is not just declared, but it is relentlessly faithful and generous because he's committed to them. And so Israel can stand there and question God because God's committed to them. And Edom and Esau will be decimated. That doesn't mean Esau and Edom don't have plans. They do have plans. I'm at point five on the outline. Uh, They have plans to rebuild themselves. Uh, They were famous. The city of Petra, that's a, a, a city of Edom and Esau of these rocky crags where they could put up their fortresses and look out over the world and say, we are better. They were going to rebuild. How disheartening for Israel. And even then the Lord says, you'll see how committed I am. Just look there in verse 4. Though Edom says we've been devastated, we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says this, they may build, but I'll demolish They'll be called a wicked country and the people the Lord has cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this. You yourselves will say, the Lord is great, even beyond the borders of Israel. How committed is the Lord? Well, Jacob will see in what God does to Esau and Edom that the Lord is committed to them. The very thing they doubt, they will see in concrete as the Lord is for them and against their enemies. In fact, it will be so magnificent. Did you hear what happens there in verse 5? The Lord will be famous beyond a border, a piece of dirt, or any nation-building aspiration. He'll be great throughout the whole world because he is committed to his people for the benefit of the world. The Lord loves his mom. He is relentlessly committed to them in a covenant that binds them together. He is exclusively for them and it is an exclusive commitment that has a worldwide significance but his love is for his mob. And the Lord's mob doubt his love and it's sucked dry as we'll find out their devotion to him. If he doesn't love us, why should we be devoted to him? And Malachi's burden is this, the Lord loves you, come back to him. And yet they weren't persuaded and they weren't committed And so do you know what happens after Malachi? There is 400 years of silence. 400 years where God does not speak to his people because they doubt his love. And then one day out in a desert, a man starts wandering around in camel hair and he's eating honey and locusts. I haven't seen anything like this before, his people, because there's been 400 years of silence and the people watch and the leaders laugh as John the Baptist walks around and says, hey, let me talk to you from Malachi, because that's what he speaks from. And God's leaders laugh at that point because they've settled into a pattern that says you can be half-hearted. The Lord's love doesn't matter, but what our goodness does, that matters, and the standards we hold are the standards of our goodness and not the Lord's love. And then who comes straight after John the Baptist? His cousin, a bloke called Jesus, and he did the same. And then what happened to Jesus? Well, they crucified him, didn't they? And if you read the accounts of his crucifixion, was there ever a man so unloved? Was there ever a man so abandoned? Was there ever a man who looked out on the world and the world looked grey? 
and he hung on a cross and his fellows rejected him. The other criminals scoffed at him. The rulers laughed at him. And there Jesus is on the cross. If there is ever a man who is unloved, it's that man, isn't it? And what does Jesus say on the cross as a man who could have doubted the love of God? Luke 23, 46. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And saying this, he breathed his last. If there is ever a human who could doubt the love of God, it's that bloke, isn't it? That bloke who hung on a cross, rejected by everyone. But what does he say on the cross? I trust you, Father. You've never abandoned me. And so I put my spirit in your hands. And it's even more striking when you realize that he is the last descendant of Jacob. The man to whom God committed in the world. In fact, at that very moment, God is not being unloving. What is he being? He's being most loving, isn't he? He's being most loving because his one boy dies for the sins of the world. His one boy dies so that the people of God might know that God loves them. The one boy dies so that sin is reversed and God's commitment is seen. And what's the stamp of that? Well, the stamp of that is that three days later, what is empty? The cross and the tomb. And we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's where the love of God is displayed in the final descendant of Jacob, crucified and resurrected. Does the Lord love us? Look at an empty cross and take a tour of an empty tomb. Does the Lord love us? Yes, because on his son, the last descendant of Jacob, all the judgment for sin was poured. Does God love us? Well, there will be days, I'm at the last point on the outline, where you will ask, where is the love? You might not write a song about it. You might not have a video clip about it. But there are days where we want something miraculous. There are days that are grey when we want something to come from the blue sky and say, I love you. I want some intervention from you, Father. And what does the Lord say? I've loved you. Just look at the empty cross. Take a tour of the empty tomb. And behold the Lord Jesus Christ. I have loved you. You are loved by the Lord in God's people. Not because you warranted it. Not because you won it. Not because your family tree is better or your attendance record is perfect. Not because you've been baptised or confirmed. You are loved as God's people because the cross is empty and so is the tomb. The last descendant of Jacob lived, died, and rose for you. Is that reassuring? Is it comforting? It's certainly immovable, isn't it? Because no one will put Jesus back in the tomb and back on the cross. He's seated above everything, and he's the statement that the Lord loves you. And is that love just here for us to hold on to and not share? No, the reason the Lord loved Jacob is because he was committed to the world in a relentless, gracious love. It's a love that is meant to be proclaimed, isn't it? It's a love that is meant to be communicated. It is a love that shows the boundless goodness of God at every moment. Where is the love? Look at an empty cross, walk in an empty tomb, and behold the Lord Jesus Christ. I have loved you, and be reassured. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's remarkable that we can read a person 
who spoke your word so long ago and he still speaks into the grey landscape of today. Father, thank you that you have said, I have loved you and we can look at an empty cross and an empty tomb and we can behold the Lord Jesus Christ who has dealt with our sins. Father, thank you that you are relentlessly committed in your love. Please reassure us. Please loosen our lips to proclaim this. And please equip us to practice this in a world that needs to know it's loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Ross. Please, you just clarify, you saw Eden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a good question, and uh, I skimmed over that. Esau is Jacob's brother. Jacob gave birth to the nation of Israel. Esau gave birth to the nation of Edom. And the Edomites are mentioned right throughout the Old Testament. Good question, Ros. Any other questions? Mr. Stiller. Uh, the, word, the word hate is used there. Yeah, it is. And you skipped over that a little bit too. Uh, <laughs> so I said two things about the words love and hate, didn't I? What, what were the two things I said? which are helpful for us to remember. First, they are emotional words, but emotional words need to be understood in their context. I love my children and I love ice cream. Both emotional words, but they are used differently in context. The context here is covenant context. And so they're not reduced to an emotional response, but they are a statement from God about his choosing action. The other side of it is don't, limit them to a dogmatic decision where you go, ah, now God, you've only loved Jacob, so that's only he'll be in heaven. No, no, there'll be Edomites in heaven because God says that. Every tribe, language, nation and tongue, Revelation 7. Revelation 7. So we need to understand the words in context, which is covenant context, which is why we spent so long on verse 1. So the passage itself is about God's relentless love through a commitment to one family for the world. And he uses language like that in a hard way. Malachi is one of the harshest prophets. He uses language like that in a hard way so that we actually see the bigness of his commitment to the broken world. So that's how I think we need to understand love and hate. Pete. Um, It's good that we have the knowledge of God's love through this. Um, What advice do you have for experiencing that love? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So Pete's question is, we have the knowledge. How do we actually experience that? So l- let, me just, let me just take one step in between. Uh, knowledge or words spoken uh, need to be words acted on. And so it's not just a knowledge of Jesus as the one who loves us, but a demonstration in history of God's love. And so we've got to have that in, in immediate step. So how will we then experience that? Uh, I think we're given three things. I think the first place is actually in God's word. Uh, I, 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 I'm so thankful that I can read the Bible every day and meet the fact I'm a sinner. If I don't start with God's word every day, I don't know I'm a sinner because I think I'm great. <laughs> but when I start with God's word, I realise I'm a sinner and I meet God's love. So I think the first place where we experience that is in God's word. I think the second place we experience that is in prayer. Uh, where we actually spend time praying to God, which is why Matthew 6 is so important and it's in the context of father-child language. We experience God's love to us in Jesus by actually depending on God in prayer and seeing that God is thoroughly consistent. I think the third place is in the meeting with God's people. Uh, This is a household. Yeah, we're ratty, we're scrappy, we're tired, we're worn out. Some of us having good days, some of us having bad days. But this is God's mob. What other mob in the world is bound together in such diversity? Uh, No other mob. And yet here we are, all because God is relentlessly committed. So I think they're the three areas. And in each of those areas, we we will come face to face with an empty cross and an empty tomb. And then we'll know God's love. Does that answer your question a bit, Pete? 